Thank, thank you, everybody, and, and thank you for our panelists, and thank you for everyone to, to be here. My name is uh, Hervé Loren. I've been uh, an advisor with uh, Horizon and Horizon Labs uh, almost from, from the beginning, and uh, happy to be here for the first uh, um, conference. Um, we have, uh, any one of these guests deserve a fireside chat for, for half an hour. This is an, an all-star panel um, and so many questions, so many things that I want to cover with, with them. Um, but first, I would like to do a, a quick round of, uh, of introductions and, um, and, uh, and learn a little bit more about, uh, about each of you. Alex, if, you, if you'd like to try. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, my company is uh, XLA. And also, we've also been known in a previous uh, time as Exola. And uh, in a summary, uh, we support 10,000 metaverses and uh, tens of billions of virtual goods. Um, and uh, uh, in most of the geographies around the world. Uh, so I'll start with that. Rolando? No, and it's a pleasure. Rolando Subiran. I'm currently leading the Web3 and Metaverse Services Division for uh, R. Donnelly & Sons, which a couple of you might know it. It's a Fortune 500 integrated company that deals with business marketing communications, obviously supply chain management, and now this transition from a traditional marketing company that dealt in print historically since the 1860s, how it's evolved to now a digital marketing communications company, and now evolving into what we're calling meta-marketing, you know, which is deriving this consumer experience in a different way. So it's readapting the past with the present and now with the future, uh, bringing it in corporate. It's a pleasure. Tarek? Hi, I'm uh, Tarek Daouk. I work for a Japanese company called Densu, and we're an advertising and uh, marketing agency, so we have a similar field. Um, I'm based in Dubai and I run their Middle East and North Africa business and what we do is we advise brands on how to spend their money to reach people but also how to build engagement with their, with their audiences. Thank you. Firstly, I would like to say thank you, Hervé, to you and the entire Horizon team. Honestly, you have put together an incredible, relevant conference. So firstly, thank you very, very Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, my name is Manoj Narendra Madnani. I am the CEO and founder of a company called Beacon Media. It's a partnership with Dr. Deepak Chopra. Effectively, our aim is to instill consciousness and goodness into the current metaverse. So we have a dual-pronged philosophy of a return on impact along with a return on in investment. We follow a simple theory of one plus one equaling 11, which is that we look to create a much larger ecosystem. It's not a zero-sum game. So everybody that we work with has to, has to feel extremely good about this. And Dr. Chopra's philosophy is he wants his content to reach over 2 billion people, and that is our goal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alex, let me start with, with you. Um, can you describe in a little bit more detail the, the plan of, of XLA? How do you guys engage in, in Web3? And, uh, and how do you guys get you know, brands, celebrities, people on board with it, what you're doing? Yes, certainly. So I meant, I meant that opening statement about the metaverses because that's been the games market we've been traditionally involved in. And the games market, every video game is basically a, um, a metaverse for the game's experience. We want to extend that now with XLA to create different types of metaphors of Web3, including metaverse uh, experiences in the Hollywood space, in the music space, and uh, uh, any type of creator economy uh, space. So um, in order to do that, we have to scale. And we know scale because we've been doing this for many years and, and uh, um, support uh, basically the, uh, the ecosystem in the games world, we're able to take those tools and apply them to the Web3 world to greatly simplify. If you can consider that there's only about a million to three million people who have ever bought an NFT, um, and there's, yeah, there's three billion creators it's not a saturated market, guys. It's a very, very tiny market. And the reason it hasn't scaled is because it's very complicated. Amongst us very technical folk that 
program that uh, understands these very deep technical concepts, if you're going to scale it, you have to make it as easy as buying a hamburger somewhere. And it's clearly not. So we aim to do that. We aim to work with enterprises that want to create new types of experiences, um, whether they be consumer marketing experiences, whether they be a way to visualize uh, in a 3D spatial environment, AKA the metaverse, uh, whether they want to purvey these new experiences with NFTs, which are another form of virtual goods and, uh, and collectibles or experiences that we haven't really gone into in terms of enabling you the utility value of these NFTs. We want to create it at scale and in a very stable way. Um, and in, unless you create it in a stable way, and really create a, a, a message that the enterprises can understand, that market will not be built. But we intend to do that. Ro Rolando, um, you guys have 32,000 employees. Um, you have, um, among the Fortune 500 companies, 92% are your clients. Um, how do you instore the Web3 narrative within your organization? So I think there's, there's three three caveats or three strategic areas. We have to focus one on ideation. There is a need, obviously, the market has a need and enterprise partners have a need to understand that, for example, Dentsu ideates, we used to exec execute. Now we have to start looking at how to actually merge execution with ideation. So I think that's the first one that's very important. The second one, sometimes I call it getting the boring stuff right. No, but it's very important, and you just mentioned it. Now, NFT adoption is at barely 2-3%. And the dream everybody talks about Web3 is we need mainstream adoption. But every gold revolution, every gold rush needs picks and shovels. And that's where scale comes into part. And right now, yes, there's a competitive advantage of being a developer in Web3, and there's asymmetric information. But what will eventually happen is that capacity will, will reach. And we'll be able in a couple of years to actually be able to BPO the services, provide scale of the global, uh, global access, and be able to deliver a global value offer a very competitive price. So I think that's the second approach. How do you tackle this? Big companies, obviously, they want the great ideas, but they also want trusted partners to help scale. And the third is how do you enter? You either have to bring talent that is inherently from the ecosystem, you have to either imp import the talent and then start upskilling internally your talent, or you have to actually partner with strategic talent to give you that outsourcing solution temporary whilst you develop that capacity. Or the third one is you have to buy it. And we are seeing that in the market, no? Right now, 70, of, uh, 70 or the last count I saw was between 70 and 100 of Fortune 100 companies are doing strategic investments in Web3 companies in some sort of partnership or another. So I would say those three, ideate, scale, and capacity, and then the correct partnership. That's the magic formula as we're seeing it right now. Tarek, um, Dentsu is a, is a huge company. It's a, it's a worldwide company. Uh, you have a lot of clients, different industry. Um, what do they have in mind in terms of Web3, and, and how do you guys help them uh, think through the process? I'll be fully transparent, right? So uh, it's FOMO. This is how the brands are now, right? So it feels there are two communities. There is the Web3 community, and obviously we see from this conference, it's dominated by uh, tech people and money people. But I don't see in Web3 enough creators, enough storytellers enough content creators. They're not there yet. And the reality is brands are not there yet because brands follow uh, content and follow eyeballs. And content and eyeballs are not on Web3 yet. Although in my opinion, since this is the future, this is the single biggest challenge that Web3 can fix versus Web2. Web2 created a, a value of $780 billion of advertising revenue for the platforms. All the creators of the world get 16 billion. 16 versus 780 billion. And 780 billion, the Web3 community is focused on gaming. Gaming is 200 to 300 billion. So you need to fix the value for the creators, 
and you need to fix the value for the storytellers to get there to create value so the brands can, can, uh, can follow. Obviously, uh, from an um, enterprise point of view, we're trying to set up, but the demand is not there yet. And I understand, I mean, the whole ecosystem is focused on infrastructure yet, solving engineering problems, I, I get that. But the storytelling and the content has to follow, uh, fix the problem of the creator so the brands will follow. Manoj, you mentioned uh, Deepak Chopra. How, how do you guys you know, think about Web3? Obviously, Deepak has been very successful as a you know, wellness you know, icon, um, you know, the number of best-selling books. I think he's getting close to, to 100 right now. Um, how do you guys see that, that you know, Web3 uh, world, and, and how do you approach it? So the, uh, the approach is based on what Deepak refers to as consciousness and mental well-being. So one of, one of the statistics that really got Deepak started thinking about reaching a billion people through Web 3.0 was during the pandemic, the number one killer was actually suicide. It was not COVID. Every 40 seconds, somebody in the world commits suicide. And what was interesting was that they developed a digital engine. It's on the Never Alone website. Any of you look at it, it's part of the Chopra Foundation. And effectively, they created a digital engine called Peewee that they found a lot of the millennials felt more comfortable speaking to a non-judgmental digital person. And what was incredible was we got so much data out of it that we were able to, that was able to save 6,000 interventions. So Deepak understands Web 3.0 extremely well, understand how it transcends current reality. And it's about being inclusive versus being exclusive. So, Rolando talks about adoption. Depending on the generation, they are adopting at a much faster pace than, say, my generation. I'm going to be 52. I'm probably considered a grandfather in this space. But the 17, 16, 15 year olds, they know this space extremely well. And they are adopting rapidly. I mean, Jimmy mentioned about the average age of the Morgan Stanley client being 60, right? But what is interesting is Deepak views this, the Web 3.0 ecosystem, as having far reach. And if we provide, as Tariq said, the right content, work with independent content creators, provide transparency in the ecosystem, demonstrate a clear track, track record and runway to the sharing is caring philosophy, it grows. So Deepak's mindset is very big in the space. He understands it extremely well. And he's realizing that he can touch a lot more people in Web 3.0 than he can in 2.0. Um, Alex, everybody knows uh, Exola in the video game industry. Uh, you guys do $3 billion revenue a year, over 700 employees in, in LA. Um, you know, the transition to, to XLA. Um, obviously, the video game vertical is something that is part of, of your DNA, of the company's DNA. Um, what are the other verticals that you're looking at in the space within that Web3 movement? So, yeah, I, I personally come from the um, Hollywood, uh, you know, sector, um, former Lionsgate executive. So, Obviously, that's near and dear to my heart, and um, um, and I think there's a real metaphor for going into um, experiences that are movie, film, television related, um, and so there is obviously a lot of IP there, and a lot of the IP wants to find a better connection with its own fan base. So, how do we? enable the enterprises, which are the film studios, to attract that fan base and, and have a better relationship with them other than just say, buy this movie, rent this movie, uh, buy tickets at a cinema, and that's it. That's about the depth of the experience so far. Oh, and by the way, Seamus is here earlier, go to Comic-Con and also dress up as a character, which is really fun, by the way, So for those who do that. So, um, so there's gotta be a way to touch history to live in a movie world, 
to go to, to be invited to a celebrity party in some instances, uh, to be able to go into a, a metaverse and say, oh, I love that world, I, I'm going to go relive its, its history. Um, so that's, that's one area. Music is another example. If you think about three uh, record labels that run the, the world of music, and yet you think about um, how we have the tools in place where every now relevant upcoming on the rise musician who's got several hundred million views on TikTok or YouTube or other social media channels can become their own record label. There are structures now in place with DAOs and NFTs to enable that to happen and we are of scale to enable those experiences. So we are doing that and we'll be making announcements in that soon. Um, if you think about the craft of making a motion picture, um, we're, we're living in a world where um, there's just too much friction to that process. You have an imperfect way of getting to your audience. Um, you find that you spend a lot of money or you raise a lot of money and, uh, and maybe the movie isn't successful because it, marketing wasn't perfect. And, and yet, people say, I love that movie and I didn't get a chance to even watch it or this or that. So we are looking at ways which creators in the filmic uh, entertainment world can collaborate in a trustless environment. That is the promise of Web3, collaborating in a trustless environment. Maybe you found a fantastic collaborator in India or in Toronto or in, and, you know, in Los Angeles where I'm based and any other place. So finding that mechanism and enabling that and helping to create a better affiliate, decentralized affiliate marketing program for that industry. So those are a couple of the the different uh, areas. R Rolando, one of the interesting say about, about Donnelly is that everybody in this room touches twice a day a Donnelly product. And maybe you can elaborate about that, but what I'd like to know is how internally um, do you share with the executive the, the, in the organizations, the CEOs, the fact that now you're spearheading efforts of something that is 100% digital? How does that transition kind of go about within such a big organization? I think it's part of this natural evolution that companies have to go through. And obviously you have to have your ethos and your principles, which is your competitive values that drives your value offer towards your customers or your consumers. And then from there you have to go towards legacy and vision as well. No, and we were a printing company that burned out with a lakeside, with a lakeside building burning down with the Chicago fire. Then we became a publisher, a book publisher company with the four American books classics in 1928, which brought out a way to actually innovate and create machinery to compete with Europe to, with, towards printing presses and bring artists. And we printed Moby Dick and we came up with the four great American classics, which brought Donnelly as a book publisher. And then we eventually evolved into giving value-added services and then printing, and then supply chain management becomes an issue with globalization and companies readapt through cycles. It, an important part about how do you bring this, the vision of the CEO is incredibly important. And there's actually a study that I recently read that points out that CEOs in global companies are much more prone to have legacy visions towards the future and potential of the metaverse than actual CIOs, CTOs, and CMOs. Because CEOs are actually looking at the legacy and they're looking at the vision and the potential. And the C-suite is then looking at the execution. How does that translate to my sales team? How will I comply with the regulatory myriad of issues that will arise from here? And I think if you have a very good vision from the top, then you have this execution capacity to trickle down. So it's interesting because Web3 is a very grassroots approach where you're changing the incentives through community stakeholding, through it's the logic of collective action that's best practice, you know, how to make groups actually align incentives. But in companies, we're seeing that this engagement is coming from a strategic, at least in our case, it's coming from a strategic vision that aligns with our story. That's why storytelling, I, I love what you said, Tarek, storytelling has, immersive storytelling in this case has to be at the center of every narrative for enterprise value to actually jump into it because it's how we communicate to our consumers and our stakeholders. No? So I think that's, that's the way we do it. 
T Tarek, I want to know from a, from a cultural aspect. Um, Dentsu is a Japanese company who was very early on um, the, the crypto world, mostly exchanges, etc. You're based um, in, in the Middle East um, and you're dealing with global brands. Um, do you see a certain difference in terms of Web3 acceptance purely based on those three cultural elements? Um, no, we see generational difference that is common. So you speak to a certain uh, profile of people, right? In Saudi Arabia, in France, in Morocco, in San Fran, you hear the same lingo, you hear the same language, you hear the same aspiration, right? And then you have three generations that we're dealing with. We generation like me, who lived before the internet and have seen the first wave of disruption. And then you see the second generation, that's Facebook generation. The generation that think they revolutionized communication and advertising, right? And up until so far, these were leading the conversations on, on digital transformation. And now you see a third generation that is talking about the power of decentralization, that don't want all the value to be with the big centralized tech platforms versus creators, versus brands, versus whatever. But if you take any of, any of these three, wherever they are in the world, they're the same, uh, the same uh, language, the same aspiration. And sometimes you're surprised. I, uh, I was talking to Gary, I mean, last year, we organized an anime uh, festival in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia. And it was the most uh, watched and attended festival in the kingdom by both genders, by everyone, because people do identify with content that is fun, that is aspiring, that they want it, that makes them have good time. And I know we had a lot of discussion about communities and that we want people deeply involved in communities. The reality is a lot of people don't want to be deeply involved. They want to enjoy the experience. They want to enjoy the story. They want to enjoy the dream that the, that the brand or the communicator give them. Not everyone wants to be super active on DAO, and not everyone wants to participate in the writing. Not everyone. A lot of people want to, right? And that's the right thing to But if we don't create the power of distributing dreams and stories and images, you will miss a lot of the people who are around who want to sit and enjoy it. Manoj, Deepak has a worldwide audience, but um, when you look at you know, the most influential market, there's two markets that you know extremely well, which is the US and India. Can you speak a little bit about the differences and the similarity in between those markets and how do you approach it? Sure, um, I, th I think what is, what is interesting is we actually see Dr. Chopra's content split into three markets. There's a 26 million following in the US and Canada. There's another 26 million in the Spanish-speaking parts of the world. And then you have another 26 million in India, the Middle East. And Asia is starting to come in because you're seeing a convergence of his content along with the Dalai Lama. There's a, there's a lot of leadership themes. So difference, differences-wise, there's not much differences in the community, so to speak. But what is interesting is the community in the US is the, that community that sort of fits the, the daytime soap opera or the daytime talk, talk show host sort of community. The ones you see in Spanish-speaking parts of the world are also, again, coming to a very similar demographic which you have in the US. In Asia, it's a younger community coming in. And what's interesting is we're finding that Deepak's collaborations, and one of the collaborations he did, he, lo he dropped one, F one NFT with, with Emilia Clarke from Game of Thrones. That was an example of Deepak Chopra, Emilia Clarke, two very distinct age groups, so to speak, but going after a similar demographic. And what was interesting was to watch the power of collaboration kick in. And then that became global. So that actually took, that added a level of globalization to 
all the communities and showed us the power of, again, one plus one equaling 11 and making things happen. And then I will finish with, with one question for, for the panel. There's a lot of Web3 builders um, within, within the audience and um, you guys are on the, the forefront of bringing, let's call it traditional audience, traditional businesses in Web3. What are the things that the audience, the builders in the space could do to make your life easier on boarding these, uh, these um, you know, um, previous generations inside of Web3? Clarity, one word. I think that a lot of, especially the enterprises, they want to think they know what a metaverse is, what NFTs can really do, because they want to sound cool, don't they? I mean, they want to be in the know, they want to be leaders, and yet there's a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of misapplication. Um, I was talking to a, a big uh, European bank, and they're like, we want a metaverse. Well, why do you want a metaverse? <laughs> well, it's great, so our banking customers can interact with the metaverse. I'm like, well, how does that look like? And and, and it really, and there is a need for, for that and that to happen, but you have to go through the steps and processes. And I really think that a lot of us need to really break down, like, what is the value of a 3D simulation in a context? What is the value of a virtual good that really is an open sesame pass that says, I'm going to enable these experiences and your audience will be attracted to that, you know, an NFT and really explain it in a way that in their own corporate missions, they understand. Because unless you do that, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have overselling of crazy solutions. At the end of the day, they're gonna be like, okay, we fulfilled our PR purpose and get rid of all this crazy stuff. And it's not really going to gain traction. So we're, we're basically doing that with our enterprise unit to, um, to build very, stable and realistic uh, value propositions um, and solutions and doing it slowly but doing it in a way that they can appreciate and they can say ah now that makes sense i would say balance every revolution tends to polarize and the debate the ethos of web3 is very well positioned is incredibly well positioned on the anti-establishment on the anti-control of data, of ownership economy, certain values that are entrenched in every person that builds something in Web3. But the pendulum has to go to a balance point. Not everything is about being maxi. A metaverse can be whatever you want if you're an enterprise player. It could be an XR expanded version of the website that gives you an immersive experience and they could call it a metaverse. It doesn't have to be, if it does not comply with A, B, C or D, it's a metaverse and the UX, UI has to be balanced. Just simply doing the connection through a MetaMask, we were checking the 20 million users or 18 million users, it's complex. You don't necessarily have to be advertising Web3. It will come. We can start building the infrastructure and providing the customer a seamless experience where they're just receiving a good product with a benefit, and you can start slowly by slowly communicating the messages. I think balance in that pendulum is important. Eric? Yeah, for me, I'll, I'll start from exactly the same point, Yolanda. Is one is focus on UI, UX. So as much as you're building the infrastructure and the pipes, the UI, UX is still very clunky, and it will alienate a lot of people who are not engineers in their, in their uh, mindset. And I understand this, this is part of maturity and time and where to focus first, but this is, this is the first one. And the second one is always have options for light touch. So those who want to be, again, deeply involved can enjoy the experience, and those who want to have a light touch can also enjoy the experience to be able to scale it to different interests of people and different, different levels of engagement. Manoj? Herbie, I think the word I'll use is patience. Rome was not built in one day. It takes, it takes time. So sitting over the last two days, listening to even the Zencoin story of what transpired during their first turbulent years, these things take time, all right? And I think we all have to just take a, deep, a very deep breath and 
things are not going to function 100% immediately, UI, UX issues, it is going to be clunky. You are entering into the web 3.0, it's still a hybrid world. Understand how to navigate it well and just be patient. And I think you need to, you, you will be able to differentiate the signal from the noise during a period of time. And that's what I tell everyone, just take a deep breath. It will happen, but focus on the right signal. That's it. Great way to close it. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you for everyone. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.